Ever wondered how nuclear power plants generate electricity? Or how the energy locked within tiny atoms can illuminate cities and power industries? It's a marvel of modern engineering, where the tremendous energy within atoms is harnessed to bring light into our lives. Today, we're diving deep into the exciting world of nuclear power generation, a process that's as intriguing as it is impactful. So buckle up, get ready for a journey to the heart of atoms and the core of power plants. Stay tuned as we unravel the fascinating process of nuclear power generation. The journey of nuclear power starts with the mining and processing of uranium. Uranium, a heavy metal found in the Earth's crust, serves as the lifeblood of nuclear power plants. From deep within the ground, mining operations extract uranium ore, a mineral laden with this potent element. But the story doesn't end with extraction. The mined uranium ore must undergo a transformation to become a fuel suitable for nuclear power generation. Through a series of carefully controlled processing steps, the ore is converted into uranium hexafluoride, a compound that is ready for the enrichment process. This transformation is crucial. Uranium hexafluoride, or UF6 for short, holds the key to unlocking the enormous energy potential of uranium. It's the raw material that, once enriched, will fuel the nuclear fission process, the heart of nuclear power generation. So, the next time you flip a switch and enjoy the benefits of electricity, remember the humble beginnings of its journey. Once processed, we have uranium ready for enrichment. The next step is enrichment, which is crucial for making the uranium usable in a nuclear reactor. Now, natural uranium is primarily composed of uranium-238. While it does contain uranium-235, the easily fissile isotope, the concentration is less than 1%. For a nuclear power plant, we need enriched uranium, where the concentration of uranium-235 is increased to around 3 to 5%. So, how do we achieve this enrichment? Well, we use processes like gas diffusion or gas centrifugation. Here's what happens. The uranium hexafluoride, which we obtained from processing the mined uranium, is subjected to one of these processes. These processes exploit the slight mass difference between uranium-235 and uranium-238. Over time, they increase the concentration of uranium-235 in our fuel. And voila, we've enriched our uranium. With enrichment complete, our uranium is now ready to be fashioned into fuel rods. Fuel fabrication gives uranium the shape and form needed for use in a nuclear reactor. It's like baking a cake, but instead of flour and sugar, we're working with enriched uranium. This enriched uranium, now a higher concentration of uranium-235, is converted into small pellets of uranium oxide. Picture these pellets as the building blocks of nuclear power. Now, these uranium oxide pellets are loaded into long cylindrical tubes known as fuel rods. Each fuel rod is a powerhouse in itself, but to really harness the energy, we bundle these rods together. This bundle, known as a fuel assembly, forms the core of a nuclear reactor. It's the heart of the operation, the place where all the energy-releasing action happens. Think of the fuel assembly as the heart of a nuclear reactor, pumping energy throughout the system. With our fuel fabricated and in place, we're ready to kick-start the nuclear reactions. Now we are ready to initiate the power-packed process of nuclear reactions. Nuclear reactions are the heart of nuclear power generation. This is where the magic happens, where we turn the potential energy locked away in atoms into usable power. The stage for these nuclear reactions is set in the reactor core, a bustling hub of energy where enriched uranium fuel rods form the central actors. Here, within the confines of this core, the process of controlled nuclear fission takes place. Fission is a kind of atomic breakup. It all starts when a neutron, a subatomic particle, is introduced to a nucleus of uranium-235. The neutron and the uranium-235 nucleus collide, and this collision causes the uranium-235 nucleus to split into two smaller nuclei. Imagine a billiard ball smashing into the triangle of balls at the start of a game, sending the balls scattering in all directions. This is the atomic version of that. But this atomic breakup isn't a messy affair. It's a clean, precise split. And in the process of splitting, the uranium-235 nucleus releases an enormous amount of energy. 
It's this energy that we capture and convert into electricity. But there's more. The fission of uranium-235 doesn't just release energy, it also releases additional neutrons. These neutrons can then go on to collide with other uranium-235 nuclei in the reactor core, causing them to split and release more energy and more neutrons. This sets off a chain reaction, a self-sustaining cycle of fission and energy release. It's like a domino effect, but on an atomic scale. All this might sound a bit chaotic, but remember, this is controlled fission. The rate of these reactions is carefully managed to ensure a steady output of energy. It's not an atomic bomb, it's a power plant. So to sum up, in the reactor core, neutrons collide with uranium-235 nuclei, causing them to split into two smaller nuclei and release energy. This process also releases additional neutrons, which can trigger further fission reactions in nearby uranium-235 nuclei, creating a self-sustaining chain reaction. This energy-packed process generates intense heat, which is vital for the next steps. In the next scene, we'll delve into how this heat is harnessed to generate electricity. Stay tuned! The heat generated in the reactor core is harnessed and controlled through coolant circulation. As the nuclear fission reactions occur, an immense amount of heat is produced. This heat is not only an essential part of the power generation process, but it's also a potential risk if not properly managed. This is where our coolant comes into play. The coolant, which can be water or a liquid metal, circulates through the reactor core like a river flowing around stones. It absorbs the heat generated during the fission reactions, effectively carrying it away from the reactor core. This process is crucial to prevent overheating and maintain a controlled temperature within the core. Think of the coolant as a heat sponge. It soaks up the heat and then it's directed away from the core. The heat isn't wasted though, it's used in the next steps of power generation. Now, we move on to transforming this heat into steam. Steam production is the bridge between heat generation and electricity generation. After the coolant has absorbed the intense heat from the reactor core, it doesn't just sit there. Instead, it's put to work in a fascinating process that turns this thermal energy into steam. Picture this, the heat from the coolant is transferred to a secondary system, usually a heat exchanger. This heats up water in this secondary system, transforming it into high-pressure steam. But why do we need this steam? Well, it's all about energy conversion. In the world of energy, nothing goes to waste. The steam we've just created is bursting with potential energy ready to be harnessed and put to use. Imagine a kettle boiling on your stove. As the water inside heats up, it turns into steam which has to escape. And when it does, it does so with a lot of energy. Now, scale that up to a power plant level. That's a lot of steam and therefore a lot of energy ready to be utilized. This leads us to the next step. Electricity generation. The high-pressure steam we've produced is directed to a turbine. Picture a windmill, but instead of wind, it's steam that makes the blades spin. This steam-powered turbine is linked to a generator. As the turbine spins, it turns the generator, and this is where the magic happens. The generator's job is to convert the mechanical energy from the spinning turbine into electrical energy. It's like a big, complex dynamo. The mechanical motion of the turbine rotates a magnet inside a coil of wire within the generator. This motion creates an electric current, electricity, that we can use. This electricity is then transmitted through the power grid, powering homes, businesses, and everything in between. This electricity illuminates our lives, but what happens to the steam after it has done its job? Cooling systems complete the cycle of nuclear power generation. They play a vital role in maintaining the balance and ensuring the safety of the entire process. After the steam has done its job of driving the turbine, it doesn't just evaporate into thin air. Instead, it needs to be condensed back into water, and this is where our cooling systems come into play. The steam is directed into a condenser, a large heat exchanger designed to maximize contact between the steam and cooling water. As the steam cools down, it condenses back into water. This water, now back in its liquid state, is not wasted. Instead, it's returned to the reactor core to repeat the cycle, contributing to the efficiency and sustainability of the process. But what about the heat? You may be wondering where all the heat generated during this process goes. Well, 
it doesn't disappear. The excess heat is typically released into the environment through cooling systems. These could be massive cooling towers you often see billowing steam, or sometimes water bodies like rivers or the sea are used. These cooling systems ensure that the nuclear power plant operates within safe thermal limits. They prevent overheating, protect the equipment, and contribute to the overall safety and efficiency of the plant. And thus, in these steps, nuclear power plants convert the energy locked within atoms into electricity that powers our world.